So I'm here at Oshkosh still and I finally had the opportunity to meet up with Teal Jenkins Skytrax and we're going to talk about gearboxes and engines today. All right, so again, here with uh, Teal Jenkins, the man himself in the flesh. I've been following you on social for quite some time and just absolutely blown away at some of the stuff that you're doing with uh, Yamaha and these gearboxes. So I'd like to start off by sharing maybe a little bit of your background, how, like, what do you do other than this? Because it's okay. not a full-time job, I understand. <laughs> like, what is your background? So my background is that I started off, well, in the Navy, working on F-14s as a mechanic, got out, went to college, uh, started working at a nuclear power plant as a machinist mechanic, and then uh, now I'm an advisor and uh, training instructor at the nuclear power plant. And that's what I do full time. So this just, you know, I've seen the necessity in trying to modernize our engines that we're using on the, at the time, the ultralights and the trikes. So I got started making adapters kind of for the Rotax Seager box onto the Yamaha engine. So, so. this really started more of like a, uh, a need to, to fill uh, a, a problem or a way to fix a problem, not uh, or a passion, not like I'm just going to jump in and try to make money out of fixing it. Right? No, you don't. You don't get into this business to try to make money or to make a living because you're not going to pay the bills. But very no, low, very I need, low volume. Yeah, yeah. So I needed it for me for my application, and uh, I actually only made one adapter, and I thought I was going to end there until I went into a little fly-in, and a couple of my friends were like, "We've got to have some of those," and I'm like. Well, good luck. I can kind of give you some drawings, you know, but yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, no, can we make the, let's make the CNC pro, you know, the CAD file for it. And, and so from there we made a batch of 10 of them and they sold really quick. And then I, I don't remember exactly how many of the adapters we made, but then whenever uh, Rotex discontinued the C gearbox, I went gearbox shopping and could not find a suitable gearbox that would work without a lot of Interations and my my thing always is I wanted it to be integral. All my gearboxes, I want them to bolt to the engine just like they were purpose built, not having like a, that I had to do with the Rotex C gearbox. An afterthought. That, yeah, yeah, an afterthought. So um, it was uh, off to the drawing board and making a lot of scrap metal. And so I've got a lot of scrap metal at the shop from making lots of different gearboxes. <laughs> and so obviously you're you're somewhat of an educated man, being your history and uh, your resume. Um, what, did, what are some of the things that you, you researched into before going about your own gearbox as far as the engineering technology okay. of a gearbox? Like so, how big it needs to be, how much oil it needs to carry? And Yeah, I mean just the engineering basics of transferring uh, mechanical force from one place to another and then I learned a whole lot more that I never, I've never learned in school about the, the, the gear pressure angles and stuff like that and the gear tooth hardness and the different gear materials and stuff like that that I never have ever learned before. So you that I had to do a lot of opening books and reading about this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and well, and talking to other people that have created drives before and stuff like that. The, the knowledge that they would share and stuff. There's some people out there that have made drives that doesn't want to share anything, but there are uh, there's a wealth of knowledge out there that people sure. that have been down the road and a lot of the hot rod guys um, that that are that are raced and created their own rear ends and stuff like that. You know. But a lot of it's just mechanical physics of transferring one load to the other. Now the biggest challenge is each individual engine has its own harmonics, resonance, and stuff like that that you can, you know, you, you got to learn in that particular engine and how it is, you know. So that was the biggest challenge for each engine. And I'm not saying that, I, you know, I created a gear, gearbox for the Apex and, it, you know, we had a number of people flying it and a couple issues with the Sprag locking up. We had to go back in there and figure out exactly what was going on there. And so, you know, the Sprag still seems to be kind of like the weak link, but we're getting them to hold up. It's not a horsepower thing. We can, we've we've been successfully able to push about 550 horsepower over and over again through that them. That's insane. The worst part about it is that low idle vibration shake off yeah. of idle and startup. That's yeah. the roughest part. And then long taxis and stuff like because that. What is the range of this from like startup uh, typical machine? It would idle at about what? Um, the, we normally like to um, idle I mean, them just in slightly the, in the higher. It was designed for what was it? Oh, idling? I think they're idling about 14 to 16. Hundred on the snowmobiles. Okay. We idle them up to about 22, 2300 to get smooth out a little bit more. And plus, we're putting a load on it right away where the snowmobile just spinning that clutch is not much of a load. So, with the prop load on it, you kind of idle it up just a little bit to make up for that. So, you go from there all the way up to which the peak horsepower? Uh, on which engine? The Apex? or oh, are... Both of them, yeah. Okay, so the Apex, your peak horsepower is, I think, around 10,200, somewhere in there if you wanted to 
the newer 165 horsepower, somewhere in the 10,000 RPM range. Most people, besides Steve Henry and the guy, Real Performance guys, run them up to about 94, 9,500 RPM for takeoff, and they're still around 140 horsepower range. Uh, and so, you know, Steve's kind of an outlier in it. But, you know, that last little bit of horsepower, like for the phaser, I always, the Yamaha rates it at 80 horsepower. I tell everybody 75 horsepower because that last five horsepower, you got to rev it up another seven or 800 RPM to get it. And, and most of the time in our applications with propeller efficiencies and stuff like that, you're meeting your tip speed efficiency pretty close to that. So your last, if you try to get it to spin up that last little bit, you're in your tip, your, your propeller efficiency is dropping. So why not just, you know, drop your horsepower a little bit, you know, call it a 75 instead of an 80 horsepower, or call the Apex 145 horsepower and, and run it up to 95, 9600. Sure. All right, so being that the four cylinder is kind of like the first thing that you started playing with, let's go ahead and just talk about how that came to be and the specs around the normally aspirated and the options with it. Okay, so um, like I said, when I first started, my first four cylinder was the RX-1, which is the carbureted version of this engine. So I was making adapters for it. Um, it seemed like everybody wanted to move up to the fuel injected engine. So when it came time for me to actually develop a gearbox, I developed the gearbox around this case. Even though the RX-1 and the Apex have very similar cases, they're different. So my gearbox won't bolt onto the carbureted version. And there's not a lot of demand anymore, it seems like, for the carbureted version. So um, that was just with the Rotax box, essentially? That was the C gearbox for the adapter Rotax okay. box, yeah. So now that I've moved in this direction, for this uh, uh, fuel injected version, it seems like there's a lot more demand. Um, currently, this is not a current model production engine, so you have to source a used snowmobile to get the engine out of it. It seems like it's a still a popular option because there's a big following on these. This is a very similar to the R1 street bike engine without the transmission, so there's all kinds of aftermarket options, and the horsepower is just amazing what you can get out of them, and the you know you turn a lot of RPM, but it's you can get extreme horsepowers out of it. So that being said, moving away from the carbureted, which don't have really a gearbox to support that, the fuel inject, what are the optimum years uh, or model of, of this engine? So uh, 2006, I think, uh, actually 2005 and newer, no, 2006 and newer, 2006 to 2006. 17. If it's an Apex, well, any of the Apex models are all going to be fuel injected. They're going to be our RX1. Now, there are some variations. They called one of them an Attack, but it's basically an Apex with a slightly different trim on it, but it's still like an Apex engine. But 2017, they stopped production in the this yes, platform. Yes, yes, yes. So 2017, I think there's some they very small production in 2018, but for the most part, full production 2017, they stopped making them. Uh, and they kind of moved over to the three-cylinder. All their new stuff now is all three-cylinder. Yeah, they only came uh, from the factory as a normally aspirated 150 horsepower. Did they, did they come with a turbo option? So actually, 2010 and newer, they're rated at 165 horsepower. So the older ones are 150. The 2010 are rated at 165 horsepower. And then what was your question about the horsepower option? Oh, if, if they had an option from Yamaha with a turbo in this platform. No, no. It's, it, Yamaha never op had a factory turbocharger solution for the for the four cylinder um, there's a lot of aftermarket companies that have the kits and stuff like that but as far as factory turbo support for the apex that Yamaha never and, offered and were it. those aftermarket developed for the snowmobile crowd yes okay. yes it, with the exception of uh, edge performance sure producing it sure. for you their guys setup. are all familiar with Thomas Hockland over there in Norway doing some well, all kinds of crazy things <laughs> I'm at the airport a lot more these days editing and walking out of the FBO, out onto the ramp, it's bright. So I've been wearing my flying eyes eyewear a lot more these days. They're lightweight, extremely comfortable, flexible, and have micro thin temples that slip under your headsets. You like saving money? Get 10% off right now by using the code experimental. Check out the links below. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com. AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com Clemens Insurance at ClemensInsurance.net The Aviators Clinic at AviatorsClinic.com Diamond Doors at DiamondDoors.com Flying Eyes at FlyingEyesOptics.com Foxtrot 95 Calhoun County Airport at FlyFoxtrot95.com
Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. All right, so moving right down the line, this is the, the next one, historically speaking, that you started to tinker with. The, the two-cylinder, what size is this in horsepower? So it is, uh, Yamaha rates it at 80. I call it a 75, just because to reach that last five horsepower, you really gotta rev it up. And the other thing is, I don't think this is a good competition, or if somebody has an 80 horsepower Rotax 912, and they look, they hear the number 80, and they go, well, I think this would be good for me, because you're working this quite a bit harder than you would a 912. Now there's a, there's a gathering of people that says it doesn't matter how hard you work these engines, they're gonna last forever. But me, new development design, not even having thousands of hours, I wanna derate it a little bit lower than the 912, so it's more of a good 582, a 65 horsepower replacement, and maybe you get a couple extra horsepower out of it, is the way to kind of look at it. And I, there was a, a large group of people that wanted the 582 four-stroke solution, and so that's the reason I came up with this gearbox. It ends up being about 15 pounds heavier than the, than, the, than the 582 when you consider all the accessories that you have on it, similar to what you'd have with the 582. But you do get a couple extra horsepower out of it. Now your gearbox on this platform, is it a clean sheet design or are you able to adapt this to this engine as well? Um, of the back splits of your case. Yeah, yeah, so it's a brand, I mean, there's nothing really similar to this gearbox and the others except for it has gears in it. The gears okay. are completely different. There's, you know, it's a, the, case, the, the housing is designed around this case specifically. You couldn't take this gearbox and put it on anything else. In fact, any of my gearboxes, I get the question a lot, hey, I've really got this, uh, this Mazda rotary or some other engine that they have in mind. I love your gearbox. Do you think I can adapt it? And as much as I would like to sell them a gearbox, I have to tell them you would, you would be, at the end, you would be throwing the gearbox back you know, away or trying to do another solution. You would waste a lot of time because they're so specifically designed for this application. And they're not a very good universal gearbox to use for something like that. Not only to the bolt-on, but the gear ratio itself to the engine RPM. Exactly, yeah. So the ratios on each one of these are based around how, how fast the engine turns. So this, this gear ratio is gonna be quite a bit, you know, in the four and a half to five to one. Uh, instead of like the Rotax offers uh, 2.62 to 4 to 1, this is going to be a little bit because the engine is going to be turning faster all the time. And, you know, people think a four stroke is turning slower. It may sound a little slower because it's firing every other stroke as opposed to every stroke, but the actual revolution, crankshaft revolutions is pretty fast. Work. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You're so su You're supplying some of the bits and pieces of like, here, go play with this. Yeah, I ho my hopes that we do the hardest for the builder and that getting a propeller on an engine and the correct ratio and for it to live seems to be the hardest problem. Somebody can figure out, you know, go to their header shop and get a header made or figure out an airbox or go get a radiator based on their airframe and do the plumbing and stuff like that. Um, so we don't offer any of that. So for clarity for everybody out there watching, this is like true hot rodding aviation style. It's not, there's a couple products, but the entire package is not quite a product yet entirely. It's still very much experimental and be aware of that. Exactly. Lee, how much it weighs sitting here? Yeah. Alright, so moving on to the current test platform, which is this three-cylinder, which you talk to people across the board that's played with aircraft engines, like three-cylinder is usually a no-no. In fact, a very bad no-no. Mm -hmm. So how are you able to utilize this Yamaha and actually fully throw it into an airplane and say like, you know what, this might actually work? Yeah, so as far as the three-cylinder dynamics, I guess, you know, um, it's inherently could be considered not as uh, torsionally smooth maybe as a four-cylinder, but um, the, it is considered, uh, we talked earlier about being a cross-plane crank, you know, the, two of the pins are never in the same location, they're firing every 240 degrees apart. Yamaha has a balancing shaft in it. They're putting three cylinders in almost everything now, power sports to hot rod cars and stuff like that. So, And what we were talking before off camera was like a typical three cylinder we might find in a car. You'd have two going up and one going down or, or vice versa. On some of the older three cylinders, they've I think they've, the two of the crank pins have been together, one piston, where this they're all in three different locations. The biggest problem with the three cylinders was they're not, they have a rocking moment to them. 
um, and that the mass is not matched. So there's a, but they have a counterbalance shaft in them to take care of that. Um, the biggest issue that we have found developing a gearbox for the three cylinder so far has been the start up and the low idle vibration shake and up to 3500 rpm but uh, right now currently we're using a sprag to disengage and engage the prop which seems to be working we've had a couple of the sprags during testing lock up on us and we're going back and revisiting how can we make them robust but i think uh, we're, we're, we're now thinking about uh, some additional mass to the crankshaft to increase the mass moment of inertia of the crankshaft because the primary reason that these engines are so light, the crankshafts and everything, is that uh, so that you can get that really fast throttle response and acceleration and we're not really interested in that. You know, we're talking a tenth of a second from full throttle, you know, to wide open RPM, back down again to get to your next corner or something like that. And we're never going to get that anyways because we're spinning a big fan out front to loading it. So um, anyway, so I think that's going to help in the development of the three cylinder. And like you said a minute ago, this is our this is our newest gearbox. We have got some out there to the customers that wanted to try their you know t early testing on it in parallel to our testing. Um, all we have early on was about 60 hours of run stand time. Was, it was pretty successful. We now have it flying in the RV9, and, and we have about uh, 58 hours on it currently. Uh, we just did a nine-hour cross country and really really liking the performance and the results of it so I think that for the most part the three cylinder scenes how we can get it in a new you can this is a new long block that you can buy um, and people like the idea of going and getting a brand new engine and starting from there and then also there are going to be other people coming online for firewall forward it won't be us currently right now uh, but Edge Performance in Norway has already uh, got a couple gearboxes from us and they're testing them and they have a couple of these engines uh, in there and I, from what I understand I think Thomas is going to be doing some dyno runs on the, the three cylinder in Norway. So I think the three cylinder is going to be uh, the, the future I think in the Yamaha development. There's always going to be the Apex guys that want to get four and five hundred horsepower but these are capable too and three to four hundred horsepower for the extreme guys also. So. Um, I think that they're going to be the future and with the Yamaha movement. All right, so this is kind of a, a deep a deep dive and also a, a broad spectrum to, to showcase what Teal has, has done, both in its history and what it's currently working on. What are, what are the products you are offering? What are the price points today in 2022 in July? Okay, so to start off with our new, our, our, our oldest gearbox, I should say, the Apex, uh, current pricing on it right now for the gearbox, we call it a gearbox kit because we, we provide in the kit all the hardware to mount it up, the new seal, a new Yamaha gasket for mounting it and everything. It's $3,700 and that's the, that's the, the gearbox kit to get, get, a, get a redrive in about an hour and a half to two hours of your time is what it would take to mount, to pull the exhaust, the, the case cover up and mount it up. Okay. The next gearbox that we have is the phaser gearbox. Uh, for the two-cylinder 500cc 75 horsepower engine and uh, that's currently $3,500 and then our newest gearbox right now uh, the three-cylinder is right at a price point of $4,200. Very good. Where can people find you online and social to uh, get in touch with you and, and follow just your progress through this? So the easiest way to get a hold of me is go to SkytraxUSA.com. If you want to get a hold of me directly, go to the click the contact button and it sends me an email. It's also got my phone number on there. And then I just kind of want to mention there's a pretty good uh, Facebook group out there called the Yamaha Aircraft Conversions. Yes. And that's where the most amount of builders are and they post pictures and talk about the different advantages and disadvantages of each engine. So if you want to become a member and get on there and ask a question, um, I'm also on there all the time, sometimes just sitting back, listening and just watching are, the activity. Are you on there as Teal Jenkins or as some other... Uh... I'm Ryan Caldwell. No, I'm just kidding. I'm Teal, uh, Teal Jenkins on there. So. Um, or actually it's just teal so okay. I'm there and then you see my Skytrax logo so all right guys well if you want to uh, the next video coming up and I'll link it up above if you're on mobile or on your desktop if you're on a TV uh, you have to search for it but I'll also leave a link in the description of this video below we're gonna talk gearboxes the internal mechanics of that next in a separate episode